verse 20. Now we're getting into Antichrist territory. Okay. Uh, those verses that we saw, they spanned a lot of uh, years. Now we're starting to get into something close. Remember, please, as you're going to... So this is John the Baptist here. This is Matthew. Okay, let me write it in, in... We're getting close now in time. So there's Malachi. There's the book of Malachi, if you want to visualize it. And there's Matthew here at the end of the 490 years. Okay? Like this. There's 490 years there between them about. So as we're moving into chapter 11, we're getting closer and closer to this. If you recall, first coming and second coming were intertwined. The conditions were very similar. We, you know, we saw we were saying... You know, you need like, there were five rulers in the east, like the five toes on, on, on the leg. I mean, it could have, anything could have happened there. The Lord shows up, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I know Elijah's not there, but the Lord says, yeah, I know Elijah's not there, but John the Baptist is here. He's in the spirit and power of Elijah. So if you accept me, if you accept the kingdom, then John the Baptist counts as Elijah and we're good to go. All he needs to die. Some people say, well, how would have the cross happened? Do you know there's a, it, first of all, it doesn't have to be a cross. Second of all, he could have died in a million different ways that fulfill the prophecies, though. The Lord had, at the very least, at the very least, he could have just offered himself up as a sacrifice. You know? I know there's, there's some details there that have to kind of match, but the Lord could have said, now I'm going to go up and I'm going I'm to kill myself on the altar. And he would have sacrificed himself. I know, like, he would, I know there's verses saying he has to be betrayed and everything, but it would have happened. It just would have happened. It's not a big deal for the Lord. And everything would have been finished by like, you know, the year 40 AD, which is interesting, which is pretty interesting because uh, from, fr uh, the, the Lord is crucified in the year 33, and uh, there's seven years left, 490, see the 69th week, the 69th week ends at the cross, 483 years, right? You add seven, seven years from 33, one week, and you get 40 AD. So 40 AD, guys, would have been the, the date for the millennium to start. Which means now we would have been 1,000 years into eternity. They really messed that one up, man. So, now when I was a, when I was an, a, 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 a young immigrant here in Quebec, I went to school, and I was in Jean Brébeuf, and the French Canadians had an expression. It was a very French kind of school. And they'd say, they said, on s'en fout comme de l'an 40. That's what they told me once or twice or three times. I don't know if you ever heard that expression. On literally, that's a Quebec expression. On s'en fout comme de l'an 40. It just kind of stuck in the back of my mind. Like, that's so weird. Like, who cares about the year 40? You know, like, it's such a... Random. Yeah, random. <laughs> and later, so as I'm studying Daniel, and like, the year 40 is the date for the second coming. Wow. It's one week after the crucifixion. I'm like, man, it's amazing. This, the, there really is a spirit at work in people, and, and the devil's basically, who cares about that year? But that was, would have been the year. That would have been the year. So That's when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's talking about the year 40. But that is a big, uh, square, uh, yes, yeah. But it's, it's, you know, who is sufficient for these things like the Bible says. So the reason, so you want to keep in mind the double application, two-edged sword, one sword, two applications over there. And with that in mind, you want to read what comes next. We're getting closer to the first coming, but we're actually getting closer to the second coming. The 490 years are almost done. There's nobody knows about any gap that's going to push things for, forward yet. Verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Now we're going to take a couple of minutes here. Because these, this is a pivotal verse in Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and this is where the commentators spend the most ink. You've got three options in history that could match that guy. <clears throat> I favor one, but I, I'll be the first to admit to you, there are problems with all the, all the um, sorry, two guys in history that match it, one guy in prophecy that could match it. So the, if you open up your commentators, almost, almost, if not almost, if not everybody, will invariably say that this refers to a king called Antioch, uh, Seleucus IV Philopator. Seleucus the fourth. I'm not going to write it. Silpator. Larkin, Clarence Larkin, he says that's Seleucus the fourth Philopator. So I'll, I'll read you what he says, basically. Uh, I'll just read you the paragraph there, because this one, this part is important. 
He says he was compelled to pay the heavy Roman taxes upon, imposed upon his father. If you remember a bit earlier, the king of the north, remember he says he's going to turn his attention to the isles? He goes to the isles, that's the Mediterranean Sea, there's no other isles there. <coughs> a guy back there, his prince kind of betrays him and he has to come back. And when he comes back, he falls, he stumbles and falls uh, and he's destroyed. Well, that was Antiochus III. Antiochus III was very powerful. His kingdom, he fought and he started taking over, he not, not only Asia Minor, he started taking over Greece. So the Syrian kingdom, the, the king of the north was starting to take over Greece and he's starting to take over Egypt. The Greeks panic and they ask help from who? Yeah, the Italians. Okay, so the Romans come and basically tell Antiochus III, Greece is our sphere of influence. That's, they're under our protection. And we're going to free the Greek cities. It's nothing new under the sun, right? We're going to free them, but we're going to rule them. So, but Rome is powerful enough at that point that Antiochus gets scared and he loses a major battle. And when he loses a major battle, the Romans say, you lost the battle, you can stay as king, but you're going to pay through the nose. And so he, he comes back to, the, for, to his own land and he goes out east, uh, east, yeah? And he tries to like sack some of the rich Asian cities so he can take the gold from the temple and start paying the, that huge debt that he incurred upon his country. Think World War I Germany, right? When they went to war, wh why was Hitler so successful in stirring up the people? Germany was under a huge debt from World War I. I think it was the Treaty, Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles imposed a, a, a very, very heavy tax burden because they're telling him, you're responsible for destroying Europe. You have to pay for all this. So the people were paying from 1918 through the nose. I mean, it's their fault, but they were paying a lot. The money was almost useless. And Hitler's like saying, this is a ridiculous debt. We'll never be able to pay it. We've got to rise up. The answer is nationalism. Let's rebel. So it's what happens there. Now, when the government is taxed upon and owes a debt to a foreign government, like a few years ago, justement, Greece, <laughs> they got skewered. The Greeks voted to go into the European Union and they defaulted on their payments. And what happened? The, they froze the bank accounts of the people and uh, I think the government took like a one third or I forget what sum, but they, they took from everybody's bank account. They just took the money and paid it over to the EU. But those guys regretted voted for the EU. So that's, so the guy dies, but his son, he's got to pay. The Romans. And that's why in verse 20 you read, then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes to pay that heavy debt in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. The problem there is that the guy rules for 12 years. Okay, that doesn't, so when you read, when you read, but within a few days he, sh he shall be destroyed, a première vue, at first glance, it sounds like from the moment he takes the kingdom and raises the taxes, a few days later he dies. That's, the, that's like the first sense that hits you when you read that verse. Isn't that the first sense that you got? I'm not saying it's the only sense, but that's the first sense that hits you. When he says in verse 20, then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes and the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed. It sounds like from either from when he gets the kingdom or there's different starting points there, or from the moment that he raises the taxes and he lasts a few days and he dies. It's not the only reading of the text, because there's nothing in the text that specifically says from the moment he reigns, it's going to be a few days. It could be that he just dies quickly, like something happens to him. He seems to be in power and something happens to him and within a few days he's gone. It could be that. But, but the first reading of the text is that he doesn't rule too long. <clears throat> so as far as I could, all right, so, but that story, um, Right, so the story goes that this guy, Philopator, to pay his father's taxes, he sends his minister, his name is Heliodorus, to Jerusalem to seize the, Jew, the Jewish temple treasury. So he wants to pay the taxes to the Romans, so he sends a guy to the temple. And he basically says, well, the temple's got full of money and gold and silver, let's use that to pay the Romans. And that's why Larkin says it's, it's Seleucus Philopator, and I respect Larkin very much, Clarence Larkin, so I don't d disagree with him lightly. But as far as I could find, that particular episode, that story, 
is only told in the book of 2nd Maccabees. So Larkin's source for that application is 2nd Maccabees. You know what 2nd Maccabees is? Good, because you're a Bible reader. 2nd <laughs> Maccabees is part of the Apocrypha. In the Catholic Bible, that's part of the Bible. They have uh, nine more books than we do. Bell and the Bird Dragon, which, I mean, think about it. Bell and the Dragon, does that sound like a Bible book? <laughs> Tobith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Esdras, The Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, 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 Sirach something like that. It sounds like Sriracha, the spicy sauce. And there's two, two more. So they've got nine extra books. And the book of 2nd Maccabees, the reason why the Catholics include it in their Bibles is because it's got prayer for the dead, purgatory, uh, weird, uh, weird stories with angels like creepy stuff, you know? Uh, so if that's your only source for that history, the Bible, Paul commands me, like young preachers and us, generally as Christians, he says, beware of Jewish fables. Remember that? He writes to Timothy, he says, and to Titus, says, don't get sucked into Jewish fables. To me, 2 Maccabees is a book of Jewish fables. There's some crazy stuff in there. And if your only source is 2 Maccabees, that's really more of an issue. Uh, was that the guy who rules 12 years or another guy? So, 2 Maccabees comically tells us that angels appeared to scourge Heliodorus, who returns repentant to Seleucus, telling of God's glorious works because he was sent to take money from the temple. Appian, writing about the same time as the book of Maccabees, says that Seleucus was killed by Heliodorus when he returned. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, on the other hand, speaks of his death in terms that imply he knew nothing of his violent death, because the guy dies a violent death there. No, sorry, he dies a death, a sudden death. Also, according to Appian, Seleucus reigned 12 years, but Larkin contends, possibly based on Appian's story, that he was killed by Heliodorus within five days of seeking to rob the treasury. So basically, nobody agrees. And when nobody agrees, better to step away. There is one guy that matches everything in there and the timeline. He just doesn't match the first sense of the within few days. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> You've got a guy who's single. Now, every, all the rulers that raise taxes. Right? Everybody. But this guy is singled out as a special kind of tax raiser. I mean, if you just take it like this, he's got a raiser of taxes. Everybody raises taxes. So, but this guy is in a special way focused on, for some reason, there's a guy who's really connected with taxing. Well, there is one ruler in your Bible that is, and, and I'm going to, you know, there's, a, there's one ruler in your Bible that's very much connected with taxing. And you all know who it is. Yeah, which one? <laughs> Augustus. Augustus. Yeah, look at Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Of course, now we've made a jump, and the king of the north now, somebody, because he says he's going to write, he's going to come in his estate. It didn't say it's a son. Okay, it's in verse twenty. He says, "Then shall stand up in his estate." I don't know if you follow this. So, if somebody takes over your kingdom, it could be a son, it could be somebody else, and anti that's when Rome starts to become really powerful. In sixty-three BC, Pompey comes and takes over Jerusalem. And the Hellenic kingdoms are over. Antiochus, the last great king of Syria, is gone. And Rome is now the power. Who's ruling over the area now? Rome. Okay. <clears throat> Let's pause. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. <coughs> Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it came to pass Luke tells us in those days <coughs> what days you're here Jesus. Jesus is about to be born close to the end that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the world that all the world should be taxed now that you would take an order of that Everybody raises taxes, but a guy who has the power to raise taxes over the entire relatively known world is something. So basically, it's the equivalent of the United Nations. You've got a guy that heads the United Nations. And the United Nations decide that all of the countries under its power are going to pay taxes. And now we're paying income tax to the United Nations other than paying to the federal government. We would take an order of that. This is major. This is major. 
Now look how many times Luke insists on the taxing. Look in 2.2. 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of? So, king of the north. It's strange that he mentions that. This, uh, this Cyrenius really existed. By the way, it was doubted for a long time that uh, Cyrenius existed. A lot of the Bible naysayers, like there was, there's no, in the Roman records, there's no Cyrenius. And then they discovered him. Quirinius in Latin. Q-U. Okay. Same. So you've got the area. It's, 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 I've got taxing. I've got a king of the north, right? I've got Syria. And the timeline is together. <clears throat> Verse 3, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed <laughs> with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Four times he tells you taxing. In the New Bibles, they say that it was a census. Yeah, that uh, uh, statistics. But in history, the census, the purpose of the census <laughs> was to tax the people. That's what it was made. You got to count the people to, to, to make sure that they pay their taxes. So that's why I, um, everything in there, and you can read the notes for some more information, sounds like Caesar Augustus. By the way, here's an interesting thing. We talk about the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire was not always an empire. Well, it began as an empire, but a small one. It began as a small kingdom. And then Rome switched to what form of government? Why is Caesar Augustus so famous? Other than the fact that he was the Caesar when Christ was born. But Tiberius was a Caesar when Christ died, and Tiberius is not as famous. Yeah, the first one. Augustus, his real name is Octavian. Okay, so you ever saw, um, I, I, I watched it with my wife, Cleopatra, made in like 1967. Boy, that wasn't a clean movie. <laughs> I thought, 1960s, you know? Like, how bad can it be? What's her name there? The one that married nine guys, whatever, what's her name? Elizabeth. Yeah, Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purple eyes. Okay? She's, she plays Cleopatra in there. I'm like, oh man, history, Bible, let's watch this, you know, romance. <laughs> and one of the seeds like, okay, <laughs> you know, so that's, that whole thing is the reason that's Julius Caesar. So what happened is Julius Caesar, Rome was very much a republic. They did not want uh, kings and monarchs. They hated the idea. Okay. Res, uh, by res publica, things of the, res is things in Latin, publica is public. So a republic is things of the people. So it's kind of democratic. And they took that from the Greeks, remember, right? <clears throat> so they abominated the idea. They didn't want it. However, with the breakdown, remember that the, uh, Daniel had told Nebuchadnezzar, as you progress down the image, you have more and more division. Well, with all those divisions, what happened is whole, everybody wanted to be like, you know, there was different sense, uh, centers of power and you had generals of the Roman Republic all over the world, and the generals were always vying for more power, and there's constantly civil wars in Rome, constantly civil wars, civil wars. So it got to a point where the people were starting to want a strong ruler to just calm things down. That sounds like very much like what kind of what we're beginning to experience today, right? Well, the reason why Julius Caesar is famous, he was a mighty general, and, and he was pretty wise, but he began to be basically like an emperor. And they didn't want to do that, so in 44 BC, uh, they surrounded him and, and stabbed him. You know, hence the famous line, his adopted son Brutus comes, he says, you also my son, is part of the betrayers. Well, this because the senators, they didn't want, they thought he was becoming too strong. No Roman general had the right to cross over the river Rubicon, the expression crossing the Rubicon. You couldn't cross over with, your, with the military. You had to leave the military and walk into Rome as a civilian. So he took, he said, I'm going to do it anyway. And he crossed... Um, the river with his army, the Latin expression, alia yacta est, the lot is cast, the die is cast, if you ever heard of it, it comes from there. He's, that's what he said when he crossed. He's like, that's it, I'm taking my chance. He's aiming to be an emperor. They didn't want it, so they, they get around him and they kill him. Well, that leaves two guys in power. Um, Octavian, who's not Caesar yet, 
one of his adopted sons, and no, yeah, but no, he's, he doesn't, uh, no, not too much of a heavyweight. Mark Anthony. Oh, yeah. And you have a love triangle between, right. So Julius Caesar loves Cleopatra and, and, and her nose, that's what they say. And Asterix and Obelix, apparently she had a beautiful nose and she would bathe in milk. <laughs> in Esther, that's what they do. Six months in perfumes and six months in this, you know. So uh, he gets a son by her, he calls him Caesarion, and he promises her that if he becomes the emperor, he'll give the authority to, to him. That, that's Rome and Egypt combining together back in those days. That's a powerful military alliance. Well, the guy gets killed. Now Mark Anthony falls in love with Cleopatra. She falls in love with him. And Mark Anthony figures, well, if I take the... Egypt is the breadbasket of the Roman Republic. All the bread comes from there. The food comes from there. So he's here fighting. Octavian is back in Rome. And, and he sees... Uh, because some people apply those passages there, the woman being betrayed to Julius and Mark An and Mar to Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. But to do that, you gotta do you gotta really twist the text a lot to do that. I'm still studying it out. It doesn't really fit so far as I can understand right now. Nevertheless, that is the historic background of what's going on, where Christ is born. This is when Christ is born, guys. This is the background. So Octavian is back there. They killed Julius Caesar. They don't want an emperor. But now Mark Anthony, when he says, well, you know, Julius is dead, I can be an emperor, I'm going to make an alliance with Cleopatra, and we'll take over the entire world. Well, he's not too happy about it, so uh, Julius, Caesar is, Julius Caesar is not uh, stabbed in 44 BC. He stabbed, I think, before that. In 44 BC is the ba Battle of Actium. So what happens is, uh, there's a huge battle now with Octavian, he comes against Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, they're together. And there's a naval battle there also, and Octavian wins that battle. So, long story short, Mark Anthony kills himself, Cleopatra kills himself, it's like a Romeo and Juliet kind of a thing. And now Octavian is the only one on the scene. So, <clears throat> the people want an emperor, but still don't want the, the, the appearance of an emperor. And so that's where like the crown, the laurel crown, you know, the crowns of the Roman Caesars, it's not a golden crown like a king, it's like a peace crown, you know, the olives wreath, it's basically... Uh, uh, primum sives or something, first, first minister. He says, I'm the first servant. So I'm not really the king, you know. I'm not going to rule forever, but I'm just like the number one citizen in the Roman Empire. But in effect, it's an empire. It just looks like a democracy on the outside. And he was pretty wise and he did stabilize the kingdom. And there was, and that's when the area of Pax Romana begins, the Roman peace. So the countries are told, you don't rebel against us, you can keep your culture, you can keep your gods, but you keep your political... Uh, loyalty to us, which is why you've got Rome ruling, but the Jews seem kind of free to a lot of things. You know, when they bring Christ to, to the Romans to betray him, Caesar says, why don't you judge him? Well, so Rome allows Israel, the Jews, to have their own courts. They just can't do the civil, they can't affect the death penalty. They can't affect the death penalty. Because they say, it's not lawful for us to put a man to death. And they wanted to kill him. So that's why they want to give them over to the Romans. They don't have the Romans, haven't, they, could, they could do their courts, but they couldn't kill anybody. Only the Romans could. So that's why they had to give them over to the Romans. Which, I don't want to get off too much, but that's pretty cool. Because they wake up Caesar early, a pilot early in the morning, and he kind of, he kind of, because they're like, they're, they're like uh, you know, we want you to do this for us. And he's like, why? What is he guilty? And they're like, well, if you were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him to you. We judge them already. They're saying, you trust our court system. Okay, this is a bad guy. We don't have to tell you why he's bad. That's what their answer. They don't tell him what he did wrong. He said, he's a malefactor. We already judged him. So, so Pilate's like, well, if, you're so, if your court system is so good, why don't you put him to death? Now, he knows they don't have the right to do that. And they have to kind of like, well, yeah, we know we can't put him to death. So we need you guys to do it. So he makes them, he makes them admit that they're in subjection to Rome. He humiliates them. It's very, it's very subtle, but it's there. And, and uh, like the commentator said, it's brilliant. He said, said, they would rather own their master than lose their victim. They said, yeah, you're right. But they wanted to kill him so much that they would rather recognize Rome as their master and give them the death penalty over Christ than say, you know what, we don't need you. But then they would have to have kept him alive. And, and that's exactly what they said. You know, we have no king but Caesar. They would rather own their master than lose their victim. Think about that. I'll take you as my master. I just want him killed. That's a lot for Jewish pride. So that's the background. 
uh, and Octavian is the one that makes of the Roman Republic an empire. Well, that's why he's Caesar. He becomes Caesar. There weren't Caesars before as such. Kind of. Julius Caesar was trying, but there weren't really rulers. <clears throat> so Rome comes into power. Christ is born under, under that guy, under that man, and, that, and he decides to tax the whole world. <clears throat> yeah, uh, there was a question. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, well, pause. So a lot of us say the Antichrist is a raiser of taxes. That's not technically true, because the next guy is the Antichrist. Okay. The next guy is the Antichrist. It's not the Antichrist who's the raiser of taxes. This guy dies. Now, he dies within a few days, so that kind of like troubled me, because he dies, ro Octavian ruled for 40 years. He died at 75, one of the longest lived, actually. Um, and then I, I was reading some, 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 there's some history forums, there's people who specialize in studying those kinds of histories, and it is fascinating. And well, it turns out that he was accompanying his adopted son, Tiberius, who would be the emperor when Christ would be crucified. Remember the Northern Sea in Israel, the Lake of Tiberius, it's called? The Sea of Galilee is sometimes called the Sea of Tiberias in the Gospels. You'll see that, the Sea of Tiberias. That's the son of Octavian, adopted son. So he's accompanying Tiberius to a new military position in Rome. And on the trip, he gets sick. And within three weeks of that, he dies. So, history, the comment, there's so many books written on that. His wife was, one of his wives was Livia. And the question was, did she poison him because he loved figs and he was eating figs that day? Did she poison him with a fig? Did he just die of his illness quickly, not because of the fig? Because it did surprise some people that he died quickly that way. Or did she assist him in suicide? Which another is another possibility. And, and, and he was really sick and he just wanted to end it. And because look what the verse says, he shall be destroyed... Neither in anger, so it's not vengeance, nor in battle. And Caesar, uh, Caesar Augustus did die of a quick illness, and it wasn't in battle, and it wasn't in anger. He died peacefully. Right, so <clears throat> now that brings us, if that is Caesar Augustus, it brings us all the way up, up here. There's a third possibility, prophetic possibility. Look in Revelation uh, chapter 17. There's a prophetic possibility, though, that it's somebody still future, that this stuff, this part here, we haven't gotten this part to. Of course, that involves big gaps. But remember, Gabriel tells Daniel in the beginning, there's three, th three kings, and he ignores the three kings. And he says, the fourth is going to be far richer. So Gabriel himself is skipping over people. There, if you read the history, there wasn't just those kings of the north and the south. This is 450 years of history. Okay, look in Daniel in Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. And the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue what? A short space, like the few days. But then what comes after him? And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So if you go back to Daniel 11, that's kind of the setup you have. Here's a guy that, that dies quickly, and uh, he's a raiser of taxes, but he dies quickly, guys. That's not the Antichrist. Look in verse 21. And in his estate, remember Revelation says that the eighth is of the seven? Okay. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person and there's the antichrist from there on to the rest of the chapter a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries daniel 8 25 he shall destroy by peace he shall destroy many so from that point on this will be on the test from, the, from that point on you can make a case for the antichrist from verse 21 on the razor of the taxes is not the Antichrist.